All right, and we're we're now live. E Tourism Summit 2020, uh, 21 days focused on winning in in uh, 2021. Uh, we've got a, a really exciting um, a bonus session today, and it's a, a, a machine learning workshop with our, our great friends at Crant. And I wanted to before I hand it over to Alvaro and the team, I wanted to give a little uh, personal insight. Um, Grant went and took a took a look at eTourism Summit's uh, Twitter account and went and looked at us and our competitive sets, came back, and this is just simple Twitter competitive set, and came back in, I don't know, I think it was a week, with some remarkable insights on how we can do our job better on social media, certainly at least using Twitter. And I will tell you that in our panel conversation talking about machine learning and AI, um, the Probably my biggest takeaway was the recommendation by pretty much everybody was just take the time and try it. Take dip your toe in and uh, to see what happens. To get some insights, and that those insights will be get another set of questions. Will be get another set of questions, and before you know it, without spending a ton of money, a ton of time, you're going to have a lot more insight, a lot more information, um, and you'll be into the machine learning game. Because I know that within 20 minutes of walking through the data, I had already asked about adding new layers of in in information into the mix so that we could get a better understanding of our eTourism Summit audience uh, through other channels like LinkedIn and other uh, reviews. So um, again, I think it's a great opportunity to dip your toe in the water, understand how machine learning can work. And then I think over the course of this next few minutes, we're going to learn just how deep you can go. So, um, Alvaro, thank you again for your sponsorship at eTourism Summit. We really appreciate it. Thank you for helping uh, guide our industry forward and, and dipping their toe into machine learning. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you and the current team. Well, thank you, Will. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. And, and I mean, everything you guys have put together is really awesome. Uh, so we think um, it's a lot of valuable content that people are having access to right now over this platform. And well, we want to be part of that. So today it's called workshop for a reason uh, because we intended to be a workshop. And uh, I know it's difficult. Uh, we're all uh, away. We don't see your faces, people uh, being part of this event, uh, but we definitely can read you. So please feel free to use the chat all the time. We're going to be posting some questions. We want this to be a, two-way conversation. We are going to share some information, case studies. Uh, what Will was just saying, like making it easier to understand what machine learning is, but especially how you can get started. It's not that expensive. It's not impossible without lots of data. And it's also relatively quick that you can get started. So the important thing here today is let's Get rid of all. The, get rid of all those myths about machine learning and being hyper complicated and just for gigs and just for big corporations. That's absolutely not true anymore. So that's what we want to try and do. That to do that, we need your help, and your help means please ask the questions, help us guide uh, the conversation, help us understand what's important for you guys. So that's what we want to do. So maybe let's get started. Um, so we're Krant, uh, we do creative machine learning. And why we do creative machine learning is because uh, what we do is work with you guys to find the best solution to your specific, to your spe specific challenge. And that's different. Every company, every organization is a different world. Every industry is a different world. We have worked uh, with very data intensive uh, categories like telecommunications, banking, uh, med tech, and all these companies have lots of data. We are very interested in travel and tourism, and that's why we are here, because we want to translate those learnings that we have from there over here. And even though it's different, there's a lot we can learn from uh, being in different categories. So that's what we want to put here to, to your service. Um, Ma, do you want to share a screen now? Awesome. So uh, again, I already told you what Cram does. Some of you... I hope we might have met in Marketing Leadership Summit in February, uh, where we had this awesome event uh, with Obama and uh, with all the speed dating and, and stuff that was really fun. Um, and um, well, we're gonna be in, in Orlando 
uh, in what is it uh, a week or two weeks it's definitely faster than we all expected to be so that's important um, we have had a couple of participations already we had a panel there's a there's a content out there uh, that guides you on how to get started with the machine learning that's also what we're going to work on today but the interesting thing that i want to mention is that we are looking for candidates or for a, a candidate that we can help uh, create a use case using machine learning with your business. And for that, we have created a form that is available and that we're going to put in the chat in a, in a minute. And if you fill out that form, it will inform your process and it will also tell us um, what you're up to and we can come in and help, give some advice, and you might be even selected to do the case study um, for free. And that case study we will present on November 10 in Orlando. So having said that, we can move forward. This is the team with you guys here today. So we have Michael Wise. Uh, he's our director of data science. He's going to be leading a section of, the, of this talk. And we also have Maurizio Boano. He's our director of business analytics. And he will also talk about a couple of examples. And me, I'm the CEO, and I will very soon stop talking so that you guys can have some fun with the other guys. All right, so let's move on. What are we expecting to get out of this today? Simplify and demystify machine learning. That's the most important thing. If people watching, if you, after this hour, think, hey, this is not so difficult, this is something that I can um, start trying, we're going to be so happy that we had this success. Second, we're going to learn more about your organization uh, and how we can help you answer some of those questions via the chat. So please, again, feel free uh, to ask as many questions as you want as possible. We're going to be happy to go into that and stop presenting if we can jump into the questions. And the third one is we will review some examples of machine learning that is being applied again we're not here to teach science. We're not here to teach theory. We're going to do a little bit of that. But the important part is, how does that uh, impact my business? How can I use that to do my job uh, in a better, more satisfying way? So that's what we're going to do. So let's get started. Marketing. We're all marketers. Marketers here. Most of us are in marketing. Um, me being a Gen X. Uh, we like to overcomplicate things uh, to sound smarter. But in this case, we're gonna, we want to do exactly the opposite, which is oversimplify it. So what is marketing oversimplified is you have a brand, you have an organization. You compete with other brands and other organizations for a limited amount of customers, clients, people. And that limited amount is, again, limited. So it depends on who of the competitors does the best job to be attractive, to be relevant exactly with what they want and also be different because if they're all the same, then it doesn't matter who they choose, right? So you want to be different, but you want to be relevant. And that's the marketing game in essence. Now, if you are a DMO, you're not just one brand. You are one brand that is composed of many different other businesses that are in your location right in your country in your city in your state so if you're a dmo the hotels in your place the restaurants the attractions the tours the parks everything that goes on in your destination is part of your brand because whoever comes and visits you is gonna have an interaction with some of these uh, businesses and if they do a great job then you did a great job if they don't then the customer will not be very happy with the destination. And that's why we think this is very, very important. And we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about this in, in, a, in a moment. But um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is something I want to bring up. All right. And with this, I will ask the first question. Very, very important for you guys listening. What is a big pain point for you and your organization right now? Please tell us. I will uh, now pass it over to Michael, but I will go into the chat 
and read what you guys uh, tell us, and then we can talk about that. All right, thank you. Mike, go ahead. Hey guys, thank you, thank you. Um, so let's talk about the different types of data, um, give like a high level overview uh, to make it a little bit easier. There's three types of data. There's first party data, and that's like the holy grail of data. This is data that you own and nobody else owns. Nobody else has access to it. So if you have a CRM, that's like really good quality um, first party data. And then any data you collect from website, um, surveys that you give to your customers. Um, so high accu accuracy and unique to you. Uh, it's a good idea to try to come up with like a list of what first party data you have. Sometimes it's gonna be more useful, sometimes less useful. And then there's second party data. And this is data that you share with partners. So this might be uh, like being a DMO, maybe you have like, uh, like some important attractions uh, at your destination. Uh, they could share data with you and that would be second party data. Somebody else has it, but you can both make use of it, but it's not open to the world generally. Uh, also like Facebook data. So like if you have like ad tracking on Facebook, you share that with Facebook, they share it with you, that's second party data. The whole world can't see that data, but you can. And then we have third party data. And this is data that's like publicly available. Anybody can go out and get it. Sometimes you have to pay for the data. Um, so that would be like reports, but that would be anybody can go out and buy that report if they wanted to, that would be considered third party. Uh, but there's a lot of third party data available for free nowadays online. And we're gonna see an example of that on the next slide. So Google reviews. Um, it's Review data is awesome because people tend to write their mind when they write reviews. So they'll be pretty specific, um, like a lot more specific than if they're just doing like a um, social media post. even in like surveys, they won't be that specific sometimes. But if you're writing a review, you're gonna let people know what happened. Uh, in some platforms, they're gonna be really detailed. Like TripAdvisor, sometimes you see these really long uh, descriptions for reviews. But there's a bit of a problem. So yes, review data is awesome, but if you look in really small text underneath Brickell City Center, you see there's almost 10,000 reviews. And that's too much for one person to make sense of. It's, it's, uh, it brings us into like small data and big data, this dichotomy. So small data is the idea of a single book. If I wanted to, I'm one person, I can go and read a book in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and I, I have a good idea of what happened in the book. That's in contrast to big data, which is like a whole library of books. So no one human can go through and read all these millions of books or even hundreds or thousands of, of books and have like a good idea of what happened, even if they make it through a lot. So that's, that's big data and that's why like big data has become relevant in the last 10 years because computers have become good at handling big data. Like they've, they've caught up, there's a lot of software. So now we have like the cloud and all these ways to interpret this big data and make sense of it. And you don't have to be a huge company anymore to be able to deal with big data. Now a small company can deal with big data. Uh, even like somebody sitting, sitting at home, uh, like who's learned programming in the last like year or two, they can deal with big data if they want to. Uh, so we're living in a, in a beautiful time and great opportunities. So let's go on to the next. Thank you. So to give each other some ideas, like what data sources do you have available where you already work with? So some of you are gonna have like, like media data, like with Facebook or Instagram. Some of you are gonna have CRM data. Um, let's try to get some examples. Shout it out. And if you see somebody like that gives you an idea like uh, of what, about what you have, just chime in at any point and toss it out there. So we have, Mike, we have a question here. Uh, Jennifer is asking, um, how can we use machine learning to forecast visitor volume? Awesome. So great practical uh, use cases. <clears throat> One of the myths that you may have like gotten the impression of over the last like five to 10 years is that machine learning is magical. Uh, sometimes it does magical things, but it is not magical. The reason I'm saying this is you need data to be able to do machine learning. So anytime you're thinking about like, like, hey, I wanna do X with machine learning, I think it can help, try to frame it in like, what, 
what data inputs do I have that could maybe help with this problem? If, I, if I'm like a person and I had like unlimited free time and a perfect memory, if I went through and looked at this data, could I find patterns that are gonna help me with this, pop, this problem? Um, so that's a good way of framing the question. So for like visitor volume, um, like try to find ways to uh, measure how much volume is coming in over time. And so you can work with your partners over that. Maybe they have an automated like logging system already and they already have that data existing. And if not, it's good to ask these questions ahead of time because you can go and talk to the partners and say, hey, if you're not recording this, can you find like um, a kind of trivial way to record this data? And then we can revisit it in two or three months when we have enough data. So when it comes down to it, uh, and we're gonna talk about this in just a minute, is machine learning is just looking for patterns. So um, yeah, I won't say anymore because I don't wanna get ahead. Uh, do you have anything to add, Alvaro? Right, see you. Well, no, well, not really, but but I think what is interesting about the question is that that's something that is key to your business, right? So um, there's maybe like like what Michael was saying, maybe there's a secondary third party data that you maybe don't not ha do not have right now, but there's maybe also correlations that we can start finding, and maybe something else gives you a hint about visitors that you might get or might not, uh, right? Things that can come out of, I don't want to say out of the blue, but that are definitely unexpected. And some that maybe are effect, uh, more expected, like events or things like that. So I don't want to go too much into detail. So that's, we move a, forward. That's, yeah. that's a great point. Um, so for example, with like Google review data, you can see patterns and how frequently people are posting reviews over time if you have a big enough like uh, attraction so you can see like, oh, there's a big spike in reviews. There's a lot of people coming. And we don't have to do that just for one location. We could do that for like a whole city, like your whole destination and see, oh, there's a, lot, a big spike around this time. Or instead of looking at the frequency of the reviews, we could do some categorization and we could find like events that are happening that maybe weren't on your radar. Like maybe there's like um, um, a cultural event that you didn't really know about, but it's popping up the same time every year. And that can help you forecast, oh, there's going to be people coming to visit this. All right. So let's talk a little bit about machine learning. But first, we're going to talk about experimentation. So next slide. And as people and as companies, it's important that we experiment. It should be part of life. It, we should have this like childlike mentality of, of wondering what will happen if I try this. Now, as children, you have like kind of, you have an advantage because you think anything's possible and you're gonna try everything. As an adult, we start to lose that because we start getting this fear. So the fear is kind of an advantage too, because we're not just gonna try things that are gonna get us in danger. Um, we're not gonna like fall out of a tree and break our arm because we were climbing something that was unsafe. We have this context as adults. So we can make these calculated experiments. We can take these calculated risks. So in this slide, we're looking at uh, something that Ben Clark at Fast Company did, which was he estimated the number of annual experiments at some of the leading companies. And we find like Google doing 7,000 experiments per year. So at any given moment, any given day, they have a bunch of experiments running. And the experiments might last anywhere from a few days to a few months to years. And the important thing is they're, they're calculating the amount of resources they need. Some of the experiments are small and big. They're setting bookends and saying, okay, this experiment's done. We're gonna implement this or we're just gonna give up on this idea. So <clears throat> we're not these huge companies, like Krant's not that big, none of us here are that big, but we can certainly be trying a couple of experiments per year, depending on the size of our business. And we should be, we should be setting aside some time and setting aside uh, to some extent money depending on the experiment. So that brings us to, uh, does anybody, like what plans do we have or how much time do we devote to innovating and experimenting? And we know at least one place uh, when we were in February that we chatted with who actually had a budget set aside for experimentation and they, they made sure they went through that and, and spent this time on experimenting each year, which was awesome and it showed. Okay, we don't have no more questions yet. 
So I'm going to keep an eye open. You can go ahead, Mike. All right. Sounds good. Let me go to the next slide then, Mike. Cool. Thanks, Mel. Uh, I love this example, and I call it the messy room example. It's a kid's messy room. <laughs> so I kind of talked about machine learning. A <laughs> yeah, it does look familiar for a lot of people. <laughs> um, I kind of talked about machine learning a little bit already. I gave one example of what how you can think of it. <laughs> you can think of like a kid as a machine learning model. So a kid doesn't know anything except for the data he's given. So like if he's never cleaned a room before and you ask him to clean his room, he's not really going to know what to do. But if you give him a bunch of data and kids are really good machine learning models, so they're going to soak up that data. So as a parent, if you go through and clean the room over and over again, like day to day, week to week, the kid's going to, like kids are fantastic learners, the kid's going to learn how to clean the room pretty well. That's contrasted to how programming used to happen and how uh, how computers used to, uh, we used to do code. We still do code this way, but like, if you wanted to hard program a computer how to clean a room, it's going to be impossible. If you wanted to tell a robot, hey, if you see a purple balloon, like go and put it in this part of the, like put it in the closet in the top left, like it's daunting. So basically machine learning is just giving a computer a bunch of data and it learning through example and making a prediction about what it's going to do. Now, like I said, it's not magical. That machine learning model is definitely going to mess up. It's not going to be perfect. So the kid's going to put stuff in wacky areas. He's going to put the balloon underneath your pillow at night. Like, he's going to mess up sometimes. Um, so machine learning models are going to not be perfect at predictions. So um, yeah, I think we'll move on to the next. Yeah, which brings up, Michael, let me interrupt you there a second, because this was, uh, this was this um, was Laurie's idea. You remember when we talked to, uh, like, which is interesting, like machine learning sounds kind of uh, scary, right? It has the word machine in it. Uh, so it's kind of like weird. Um, and Laurie was saying like, maybe the first thing we should do to make machine learning more accessible is change it, change its name, right? And maybe you shouldn't be called like machine learning. So um, that's why the example with the messy room and with the kids, and I mean, I don't want to say let's call machine learning kid, right? Don't get me wrong. But um, thinking of it as a, as a person that is learning and helping and growing I think that's probably easier for for people to grasp and say like, oh, okay, that, that, that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. It's not like I'm teaching a killer robot to do something, right? Yeah, great. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually thinking about that after after Lori said it, and um, like, and they actually teach you this sometimes when you're learning machine learning. Is it's it's basically just machine. It's just a uh, pattern matching. So it's it's looking at real data. It's finding real patterns. Sometimes the patterns are, or well, often the patterns are too complex for humans to see. But we can program a computer to look for those patterns. Yeah, and I think Mike, that that goes back to your point about focusing on the data, right? And making sure that the data you have is of good quality um, and can really serve that purpose to basically train that machine on how it should be finding those patterns, right? Yeah, exactly. There's the uh, the adage, garbage in, garbage out. Exactly. But we can um, always, like the important thing is you at least have the data. Often you can go through and clean up the data. You can like filter out the garbage and then you can have like a, a somewhat better model happening. Right, right. So do you wanna to talk to the group about um, some of these examples that we have here? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, a lot is possible in 2020 that wasn't five, 10 years ago. Uh, like I said, like one person can succeed in a lot of these things. Uh, so here's some examples of what we can do with machine learning. So sentiment of sentences. So all those Google Google review uh, reviews that we were looking at, we could find the sentiment of each of those. So we could find of all the positive reviews, what are they talking about? Of all the negative reviews, what are they talking about? Um, we could also find topics in large bodies of text. So before we were saying, oh, this is a negative sentence, um, we can find like the, the main themes of what's talked about. 
Uh, we can also predict things. So you can think of Netflix recommendations. How does it know uh, what you want to watch next? And Netflix is like a beautiful example because like with just, I think it generally takes like three videos, three, three movies for Netflix to find what your personality is and give like a really good recommendation. Um, and then there's recognizing objects and images. So uh, computers have gotten very, very powerful nowadays. Uh, in the last three or four years, computers have gotten better at recognizing faces than humans can, uh, which is a little bit creepy, but we can use it for less nefarious purposes and, and, and do useful things. Uh, there's a lot more examples of machine learning, but these are just to give you some context. Okay. So why is all of this important? It's because the ecosystem we're in nowadays in business, the bar has been lowered to access all of these things. So companies are going to be taking advantage of these. Like you look at all the leaders and they're super analytical companies. So they're running these experiments, they're using machine learning, they're using big data. So you don't have to aspire to get all the way to where they're at. Okay, we're, we're not there. You can be you can be lower and, and start off with baby steps. So this is a great book called Competing on Analytics. Alvaro introduced it to me. Uh, and basically it, it gives you guides and um, an understanding on how to move towards being analytical in business, how to outcompete uh, your competition. So starting to close up on my part, Machine learning is not expensive anymore, okay? Five years ago, it was pretty expensive, and 10 years ago, it was, it was really expensive, okay? But a lot of programmers have learned how to do it. There's a ton of software libraries to do it nowadays, so the bar has really lowered in how much you can get done to the point where we can come and talk to you guys today and say, look, we could probably do something for you guys. You guys could figure out like what to do uh, yourselves sometimes. Um, it does not require a lot of existing data. So 10 years ago, like you had to have big data do, to do machine learning. Like you had to have millions of, of rows of data. But now you don't need that. Machine learning has gotten a lot better. And then finally, it doesn't take a long time to, exp uh, to implement it. Like we could, uh, you can get something done in machine learning in, in uh, weeks or a month. <clears throat> so, the t one of the takeaways we wanted to convey to you guys is uh, like start taking steps to prepare yourselves for being analytical. So even if you don't plan on using machine learning, at least try to keep in mind what data you have, what data you can collect and, and make an effort to do better there. So you can look internally at what first party data you have, but also third party data that you can access that everybody has. But I guarantee you a lot of people are not taking advantage of it yet. Uh, and then finally, uh, have actionable insights. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I think that's that's some some really important points and kind of something we wanted to drive home with with the group here today. Um, especially the part about um, how long it takes to implement. Uh, as Alvar mentioned at the beginning of the session, we're going to be picking um, one lucky uh, DMO or company or organization to partner with to put together a case study before. Um, November 10th. So that's not that <laughs> that long from now. So you can um, pretty much bet that we're going to have something done um, and we're going to be able to demonstrate that we can actually build something in, in that short amount of a time frame. Um, so with that, um, I, I guess we can pause for a second. If there's any questions, um, you can continue asking them. If not, what we're going to do now is jump into some kind of real world examples of how we've implemented um, the use of machine learning data um, to kind of help our clients in, in different um, sections of their business. So um, Alvaro, Mike, any, any further comments before we jump into that? No, I think, um, so we had Jennifer's question about the visitor forecasting. Um, and she was telling us that she, she was uh, not doing it yet, uh, but, um, so she's she's interested in that. So we can maybe when we go into the examples, help her get an idea on on, on what would be like familiar and and how to how to achieve that. Sure. sure. 
Um, Will just asked a question in the chat. Can you give us some examples of data that a destination can use to start a machine learning program? So emails, Twitter, linked, um, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, and I think that's a great question. That's that's one of the pieces that, that we mentioned in this slide and, and we hope gets through to everyone is that um, um, it's great to have your own data for sure. And that's kind of what, what Mike mentioned about the holy grail of having first party data if you have CRMs um, already in, in the works or you're sharing data with your partners, that's, that's great too. But even if you don't and you don't have a lot of data, you, can, you still can go get data. And that's the kind of the, what we can do with third party data from, as Will mentioned, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, reviews that we talked about, news articles. Um, so we can kind of get all that information. There's a lot of it out there and start understanding trends um, that are going on in your, in your specific area. Um, so I hope that answers the question. And, and obviously that can be kind of further enforced with any other, um, any other data that you have already at your disposal. Yeah, um, maybe maybe to Will's point, I just want to give this this example because it's it's funny. Um, we were working with this really large um, company. They had over four hundred stores in the U.S. Uh, they put a lot of focus on on customer service, and they invest in uh, training for their staff so that they are well prepared to manage customers and and give a great experience. And of course, they do surveys and do all that. So why I say that is because they're focused on that. They asked us to do a review uh, analysis, like Google review analysis. If you have 400 locations, nobody's going to be able to look at the reviews in 400 locations and do like a proper analysis of all of that. And one very interesting thing that came out of there that they didn't see anywhere else was that their restrooms were being like the thing that was putting down the customer experience in the stores. So just the restrooms, they didn't, they, they were not full, they were not a restroom company, of course. <laughs> they sold different things, but just the restrooms um, for, for a tiny reason with a very small amount of investment, they were able to fix the, the restrooms and then from there improve the experience in, um, in a very positive way. So that's why I mentioned that is because that's data that is out there right now, available, but most companies are not being able to, to leverage. And we're talking about destinations, and we're going to give a couple examples in, 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 the, in the next couple of slides. But um, you have all the review data from all of your businesses in, in, in your destination. That's just there waiting, waiting for you to go and read. The same goes for Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, news. Um, Facebook, everything is, most of that is public. You can go and, and, and see that data. And um, that's, I, th I think that's one of the uh, places where you want to start if you still don't have like first party data. Um, but I also want to say, once you start with that and you start collecting that type of data, um, it, it, it makes you stronger. It makes you stronger uh, looking into the future and how you will integrate other sources to that because you're already having a capability. And that's what men, Will mentioned in, at the beginning. Uh, and I want to repeat, which is it's, it's good to get started with something, even if it's small, it's quick, it's third-party data. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alvaro. And that, that's actually a good segue into our first example um with the review data but before we jump into that we kind of broke down these these examples into things that you can do to kind of uh do some internal self-improvement on the internal side with with the experience example we'll go into um and then on the external side competing um and understanding how you exist in this kind of competitive set um and this goes to i believe will's question in the chat just now about can you compare uh, destinations, digital engagement and brand uh, with competitive destinations? And uh, the answer is a resounding yes. Um, we can certainly look at the, the engagement that, that different um, uh, data pieces of different um, destinations have and how they compare. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. First, I wanna uh, talk about this experience example and 
Um, Mike mentioned uh, review data and how, how important this is and how rich this is, and, and Alvaro was just discussing this as well. One of the things we can do is put together all this data and do apply machine learning technique called topic modeling. Um, in this case, we're, we're using data for one brand to understand the different topics that that brand is composed of based on that review data. And what this is, what this is telling us and, and the output that we're getting from this is an understanding of what are the conversation topics that are dominating our brand. And this is where you can kind of see the restroom example that, that Alvaro mentioned. Um, I believe there's also another interesting example, Alvaro, I don't know if you wanna um, explain the uh, Myrtle Beach elevators. I don't know if it was something similar, but um, if they implement the topic modeling, but, but it's an interesting case yeah, nonetheless. That's, that's a very good example. We, well, um, Scott, mentioned that on the panel last week, which was, um, again, in Myrtle Beach, they were looking at review data and started seeing that the elevators were like a big issue, uh, not for one specific brand, but like in general was an issue. And what, what they saw was that they only had one elevator repair company in, in the destination and in a high season, uh, they just, they were ju they just were not enough to serve all the elevators in the in the destination. So what they ended up doing was bringing in another or or I don't know if more than one uh, elevator company. But that's that's like a really clear example of that's something that nobody will tell you like hey you need to bring another elevator company into your destination. Nobody will tell you that in a survey, uh, and nobody's gonna tell you that on on social media. So what they saw was the problem of the elevators being repeated over and over and over again, and then understood what the cause for that for that problem was. Um, also, like the toilets, it's it's an example of, of things that you find in the data that you cannot find anywhere else. So yeah, I think that's a good example. Also, um, Will has another comment here where he says, can you compare your destination's digital engagement and brand with competitive destinations? Yeah, yeah, and I had touched on it and I'm, I'm glad you, you brought it back up because this next example um, touches right on that. Um, it's about relevance, right? And how relevant your brand is in the context of these competitors. And so what we've done, and we've done this for, for quite a few of our clients is create this brand love or brand affinity score. Um, and what this is doing is it's tracking how much a brand is actually engaging with the public um, and how much the uh, public is engaging with the brand. So how much they're posting and how much the people are, are reacting. Um, and it's important to see this not just as like a snapshot of a single day, but as a, a value that, that happens over time. You're not gonna impact your brand love score by just having one rock star post one day. It's about building on that. And so we look at kind of the a last 30 or last 45 day uh, rolling average to get an understanding of how that engagement is is trending over time. And so here's like a, a clear way where you can see um, how different brands are comparing in terms of that that digital engagement. And this is kind of a composite score that that rolls all of that up into like a, a nice summary. Um, so yeah, so we can certainly do that. Um, if the data is out there, we can we can certainly measure it and, and calculate it in that way. And and to Will's point there, Maori, um the interesting thing, because this example is with um, with malls, right? So normally you don't have like a lot of malls in, in one destination. So it's their their com their competitors. The same with like DMOs are across the country or even across the world. So that means it's not very it's not very clear who your competitor is because your competitor may be different in different moments or for different targets, um, and that is why. Uh, this type of, 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 of machine learning use case is so relevant because you can compare your destination is what Will is, is, is asking. You can compare your destination with the destination in wherever part of the world because the data is av available. And even if, for example, if you're a beach and you want to compare yourself against beaches in Latin America or Asia or Europe, you could do that because um, the data is available. And from that, the interesting thing is, of course, you're, I mean, maybe maybe you compete direct, maybe not, 
But the good thing is you will definitely learn from what, what's working for them. And that's an insight that you cannot get anywhere else. So um, I think that's to, to Will's point of competing against other brands that you maybe normally not don't look at. Right, right, yeah. And um, I think it's also important to note here where, where machine learning is actually fitting in because on the surface, it looks like a very kind of simplistic trend line, right? That's telling us, okay, that's my engagement, but really it's, it's a lot more to it. Um, under the hood, we're, we're performing sentiment analysis on all these comments to understand um, whether people are being positive in what they're saying or being negative, because that should certainly impact how your brand is perceived. If you're getting a lot of negative comments, you should not be getting the benefit of a lot of comments in your engagement score. It should count somewhat against you. And if on the converse, if you're getting a lot of uh, positive comments, that's really beneficial. Um, so we're measuring that and baking that in to this calculation. And it's kind of something that we try to do with, with all of our deliverables is, yes, there's probably a lot of complicated stuff going on behind the scenes, but at the end of the day, we need to deliver something that is um, accessible and readable for our clients. And, um, and that's, this is kind of how we, we push that through. Um, Mike, I don't know if you wanted to add something to that. Um, uh, you sort of touched on it, but um, like, what are some example data sources for this brand love square? So for this brand love score, this is a combination of kind of a, a lot of what we've discussed, but primarily social media data. So here we're, we're pulling data from Twitter, uh, getting replies to brand posts, Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, not LinkedIn in this case, though we have done it with, with LinkedIn in the past, which is definitely a, an interesting use case. Um, but we're taking all that information, getting all the comments from those posts and, and calculating this brand love score over time. Um, next is, this is kind of going back to the example that, that Alvar just mentioned, and this is um, kind of a, a snapshot of what we did for eTourism. And here what we were able to do is actually look at three groups. We had eTourism, obviously, um, the one we were focusing on, but we had a group of competitors and a group of benchmarks. And so this is, we took um, for the benchmarks, events like South by Southwest, um, these, these big events that are kind of, um, leading the, the, the direction of how events are, are managed online and, and how they're interacting with the public. And so we had, this is kind of like a benchmark group, but we also had competitors that were more in line with what e-tourism is about. And we were able to do this because this data is all available, right? In this case, we looked at Twitter data specifically. And we, we did a lot of the same things that, that I just described in the brand love score to be able to compare uh, these different brands based on their engagement online. So I'll, I'll add, there's some pretty cool things that come out of this type of analysis, like in this dashboard in particular. Um, you can find like influencers for certain events. So you can find like, um, uh, I guess for like SX, SXSW, you can find people who are who are always like talking about, talking about it and influencing people on it. And maybe you don't want the top, top person there, but you can find somebody who's pretty influential and maybe reach out to them and get them to help with your event if you're somewhat in the same category as them. So here we don't look, look at just SXSW, but we look at all of these different uh, events and we can we can find the people who are influential and reach out to them. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And, and as you can see, as we kind of develop these use cases, they, they definitely become um, customized to the client and to the task at hand. Um, there are nuances to, to every single project we work on. Um, and that's kind of something that's that's true of of most machine learning applications. Um, and so it's important for us to always keep that in mind. So in this case, uh, what Mike mentions about kind of those influencers and looking at the uh, competing uh, events is super interesting and, and I think super useful to the team. Yeah, and I just wanna add, so, so um, what we're trying to do with this, with this uh, workshop today is also give you some ideas uh, so if you're already working with partners or, or or if you have a team, like some destinations do have a data and analytics team, maybe there are some ideas that you can implement in-house. So the idea is, uh, again, demystify it make, it, make it actionable so that you guys from tomorrow can start like 
making a plan on on how to tackle this this type of things and this is just uh, an example again every destination is a different world yeah that's actually a good point i, I never thought of before is uh is like you probably like depending on the size of your destination you probably have some businesses that have their own their own like data and analytics department so you can certainly work with them and and get them to help you get started mm -hmm. sure um, so now we're going to switch gears to something um, a little different, but again, related to kind of how you position yourself to the outside world. And it's something that also has a lot to do with, with your competitors, and that's content planning and figuring out what to, um, what to talk about, what to post about, how to engage with the audience, right? And so we have a few different ways of, of going about this. Kind of one of the, the highest level ones is this brand equalizer that we developed. Um, it basically reads in all the data. Um, that's being uh, brought in from the social media platforms, and we categorize it into a, a set of predefined topics, right? And these topics can be um, defined by the strategy. They can be defined kind of by the topic models that we looked at earlier. Uh, but basically what we try to do with this is understand how should the brand be distributing their conversation? Uh, and we measure that, and we track how it's uh, going on over time to make sure that we're staying balanced. And so that we don't lean too far into one direction because it'll go against our core strategy of kind of appealing to these four or five, however many pillars that we have in our organization. Um, so this is a, a neat way to, to track that and, and quickly see whether your brand is, is balanced or not. And, and that's um, something that is in the, in the travel and tourism industry is talked about a lot, which is uh, you cannot be everything for everybody. So you need, so basically strategy is making the decision of what not to be and what to be. So that means like, that's like sometimes very painful, uh, but it's a des uh, decision that needs to be made. But once it's done, then you can start tracking that because you're, if you're going to be one thing or two things or three things, you want to be the best in that. And that's what differentiation and being able to put out content out there that makes you actually stronger exactly where you want to be stronger um, is is so important so for example if we're if we're feeding this dashboard with a bunch of like reviews data from TripAdvisor and, and Yelp and social social media and everything for a destination you might have pillars like family you might have another pillar that's adventure you might have another pillar that's food you have to choose what balance that you want to be pursuing so you're not trying to to boil the, the whole ocean yeah, and certainly. so i'm oh, sorry for example like if if everything that people say on social media and every single review has the word like children and and, and family in it then your your in your family square is going to be a hundred percent and the other scores might be lower so it's about choosing the balance that you want to aim for yeah yeah thank you guys um another kind of development to this is what we call brand defense and this is interesting because it takes again in this case um five different pillars retail variety hangout food and experience this is again from the mall example and looks at the share of voice and the share of engagement that brands are are generating um, so we're looking at how much they're actually putting themselves out there and how much the public is kind of reacting to that um, and this is super interesting because, again, with share of engagement, we're not just counting likes and and um, and shares and views. We are taking that into account because those are important metrics. Um, but we're, number one, counting the value of each of them because a like is not equal to a view, is not equal to a share, is not equal to a retweet. Um, so we're, we're weighting those things appropriately, but also looking at comments again and understanding the sentiment behind comments to generate an engagement score that truly represents uh, what the public uh, believes and, and, and likes about a certain brand. Um, so this is the brand defense and it's, it's useful because it allows you to keep track of, of where you're positioned. Um, before in the brand equalizer, what we saw is kind of how you're internally positioned with your communication. Here we're seeing a little more of external uh, positioning. How are you talking about different topics with respect to your competitors and how are you engaging the public in those topics with respect to competitors? Um, so this is something interesting that, again, can be done um, pretty much for any brand that, that has that, that information out there. Um, 
and almost all do. And it's super cool because like this is something that would be pretty difficult to get through a survey or any other means. And, and this data is just out there sitting, waiting to, to be analyzed. Um, let me see. This next one is, is even more detailed. Um, and what we're doing here is looking at keywords. And this is like very tactical, um, kind of goes, goes to that content planning goal. And what we do here is we distill all the terms that appear in the uh, body of text for each brand. And we break it down into parts of speech. Um, they're already broken down by platform, uh, by, what, by what topic each word pertains to. Um, and what we're able to do is actually calculate a relevance score. So this takes into account the frequency of usage of a term. So if a brand is saying the word children a lot in their posts, um, that, that would have a high frequency. But if all brands are talking about children, right, then the relevance may be lower because it's not a unique, a unique term to that brand. Um, and so we calculate this relevance score that allows us to really get a sense for uh, what words each brand is actually owning um, what topics they're, they're controlling and, and which ones they can kind of go out and, and expand. On. So in this case, we worked with a, a client that had nine competitors and that's why you see 10 different um, visuals on the, on the screen here. And so we're able to see the, uh, the top keywords filtered by any of those parts of speech uh, for all the brands. And so again, a very tactical usage for defining your content, defining what um, you kind of want to focus on and in this world of um, kind of SEO and, and Twitter where every word and every character counts, it's important to kind of understand uh, which terms will really um, motivate the, the public to engage. And so Maori, just let me add to that because also uh, from Andrew Wilson, which um, who was with us on the panel last time, he said like sometimes it's, you get so much data that that it's like difficult to to use it um, and it's difficult to turn it into like an action. And I think that's like a great, great thing to keep always in mind, whatever you guys are gonna do, have in mind, how are you gonna use it and are you able to execute against that? And that's why examples like this, because he said like, hey, I did a study and I got like 30 different uh, segments. Now I cannot do 30 different campaigns because I just don't have the bandwidth to do it. So in this case, for example, this, this example, you would say, okay, if I can't do that, then at least I wanna pick the words, the concepts that generate the highest impact in what I need to do as a destination, which is engage and attract people. So let's be very efficient with the words that I know will work because I've proven it and it's available in the data. So it's, it seems very, it is very tactical. It seems kind of small, but it's very, very practical. And that's why we also keep repeating this thing. Machine learning doesn't have to be uh, super sophisticated, weird, strange things. It can be very simple and very applicable like what Mauricio is, is, is sharing with us. Yeah. Um, and, and finally, um, speaking of crazy, wacky things, um, this is probably one of the more uh, interesting applications and, and Mike also touched on it is differentiation. And it's one of the things that's really opened up um, in the field of machine learning and that's computer vision and actually turning images into data and information that can be read um, and kind of interpreted. So what's, what's going on here is that the machine learning model is trained to actually identify objects in an image and label them. And so an image can have multiple labels. In this case, you see things like tree, outdoor recreation for the whole thing, boat, canoe, paddle, person. Um, and so we start getting a sense of what is going on in these images. And you can kind of see where this is going in that we can take Instagram data in. And so this is kind of a, a toy example we did um, with some PMOs that shall remain nameless um, for this purpose, but uh, basically understanding the, the images. And so, yeah, you can look at this and you can get a sense of, what's going on with each, but when when brands have a lot of images or there's a lot of user-generated content, um, even on Google reviews and things of that nature, there's too much for the human eye to parse. And it's such an important medium, what we see, right? I think it's something like 80% of all impressions are 
our core site. Um, yeah, we need to we need to be able to to get a grasp on this and understand what's going on. And so we ran computer vision on these Instagram profiles on the images themselves, forgetting the text on the captions and the comments on the images themselves to understand the labels on each. And putting it together into this visual, we can start seeing what is coming out. And some of them are obvious, right? We saw from the first page that DMO one is very much focused on posting about the beach and the ocean and, and things like that. And so we see them very strong here. But then we see in DMO2, things like architecture and city tend to stand out. And in DMO3, things like food, they're number one, and tourism. So these are points that you as a DMO can look at and see what the competition is doing. What are they focusing on? Is that something that would be beneficial for me to strategically um, pivot to? Or should I focus on what I'm doing really well already? If there is something there. Um, so this is a really, I think, practical example, but it also kind of flexes a little bit of the muscles of machine learning, right? And shows you that, yes, there's, let's start with the basics, but there's also some really cool applications that are very accessible. Um, and I don't know, Alvaro, Mike, if you want to add anything to that. You said it perfect. Great. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. And so let me move on to, to this last slide um, before we kind of open it up to, to any other questions. But um, one of the things we mentioned is that uh, I think we'll mention at the beginning is the baby steps, right? Um, there are steps that we can be taking right now um, with all of you to kind of start implementing um, machine learning or advancing any sort of analytic practices you already have in place. Um, and so some specific projects that we uh, have conjured up that we think could be useful and these kind of incorporate many uh, of the examples that we've talked about and in the end will be very much tailored to your use uh, are finding insights for competitive advantage in public social media data. So we've talked about this a lot, um, is looking outward, seeing what the public is talking about, both about you and your competitors and seeing kind of where you fit in there. Um, and that's sort of the, the example we did with, with e-tourism as well. And then on the, on the flip side is finding opportunities for improvement internally. So looking at review data from local partners and looking at what are some trends. So going back to the restroom example or the elevator example from, uh, from Scott from Myrtle Beach um, are very relevant and pertinent to this. Um, it's information that, that you could be collecting and could even be useful to, to the partners and kind of start building a relationship if it's not already there for, for data exchange. Um, and then, because it's important to talk about um, is the expectations, right? Um, this is a reality. There's, it's not free, but it is um, uh, cost effective and it doesn't take a long time, right? So we would expect these types of projects to take anywhere from, from two to four weeks. Um, obviously with the case study we'll be doing, uh, we'll be able to demonstrate that, that in a matter of, I think it's like a week and a half, we'll, we'll put something together and, and we'll be showing that to you guys. Um, in terms of budget, uh, you can see there it's about 5 to 25K, depending on the complexity, the amount of data. Because, um, again, uh, as Mike mentioned, um, this data is out there. And a lot of times it is very accessible, but it isn't always free. Um, so you can you can pay for that and you can pay for getting more data. You can pay for getting that data ongoing. Um, but really, it can be uh, scaled to whatever the, the needs are. Um, and then finally, the, the point about existing data, you don't need to have any right now because we can go out and get that um, and, and use that information that's already out there in review data, in public social media data, news, if it's relevant, um, or anything else you can think of that's, that's out there that's, that's important to your brand um, could probably be acquired and, and collected. Um, so, so yeah, that, I think that summarizes everything we wanted to to get through with about a minute to go. Um, I don't know if we have time for, for some questions or, or final comments from the team. Uh, so we talk about that. Well, I've been looking at the, the chat. Jennifer, thank you very much for, for your question, for being active, helping us uh, um, at least talk about, about your idea of visitor forecasting. Uh, that's great. That's very helpful. Um, I don't know. We have like a minute. If somebody else has a, has a question, um, if it's not the case, I don't know if Becca or Will 
you have any yeah. questions or if not then thank you very much for being part of this yeah i would do i would do one final plug for the form um i believe it was shared in the chat if not we can share it again if you want to go in there answer it's i believe five or six very short multiple choice questions um where you can kind of tell us a little bit about where you stand if you're not kind of feeling sharing it into this public chat room um we can take that in and we can kind of look at it internally and, and provide you some feedback and kind of discuss these things uh off off air um, yeah that, that's that's actually thank you maori because that's important so uh for you for you all thank you for for making the time we know there's a lot of uh, of, of busy things going on so thank you for the moment you you you, you shared with us and we're open we're happy to answer questions and have ideas with you guys. So don't don't hesitate on contacting us uh, through eTourism directly, however is better for you. And we're also be gonna be in November um, in Orlando. So hope to see some of you over there. So thank you everybody. Bye bye. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you guys.